Um, I am Shannon Fitzpatrick. You can find me pretty much every day at the uh, Diablo Road store in Danville. I'm store number seven. Um, but I am happy to be at the Pleasant Hill store today, store number 15 in Pleasant Hill on Contra Costa Boulevard. Tim Nash and his staff here, Kylia and Sam, always set this room up amazing for me. So I really want to give a huge shout out to them and thank you for uh, letting me use your space. Everything is always perfect. Um, if you're tuning in today, then you know that we're kind of talking about what to do in the garden. The way that it was set up originally is that it was um, just for May, like it was supposed to be the May what to do in the garden. But as I was looking at the rest of the summer, because, you know, there's only one more webinar this summer that, that uh, as Taylor just mentioned, that Jen is doing, and she's going to do an herb planter. And then we don't really get together again until, you know, August. So I just really wanted to check in and make sure you guys have as much information as humanly possible so there's a lot of you if you went to the website and you're on the learn tab and you're in the webinars there's a really involved outline i i'm sorry that it's so long but it is um there was just a lot of information so i have like may and june and july in there so we're gonna just kind of speed through things please follow along on your outline like taylor said said, jump in with any questions, anything that I'm going too fast over. Um, I feel like, again, Pleasant Hill did such a good job that everything I mentioned is in this room somehow. So I'm just going to do a bunch of pointing, but follow along on the outline. That is where you can find it. And I promise I will try not to like speed talk, but I want to get it all in. So, um, so again, what to do in your garden this month for May. It's already the 20th today. So we're kind of on the far side of any kind of prep or anything like that. But so for May is kind of here comes the sun. So I was asking like, where should we be? What should be going on in your yard? What should you have done? Or kind of where should your garden be at this point in May? So you should have, you know, been kind of planting all of your summer edibles and annuals and that kind of stuff. So you've got your squashes in, you got your tomatoes and your peppers. You know, your herbs are going crazy. You have your herb box. You are mixing in some of those things together so that you can kind of cross pollinate That you can also use them as um, companion plantings. Some of the best companion plantings are like annuals and veggies and that kind of thing. Marigolds are huge for that. They help to keep pests away. Um, so if you don't have any marigolds in your, in your veggie garden, definitely add some. And then there's so many different like um, annuals that are also edible, like nasturtium. I've seen people use marigolds like in salads. Um, I've seen, what was the other one we were looking at the other day? There's like a couple recipes where you can do like petunias. There's still some violas and pansies floating around out there. So lots of annuals that can also, you know, be part of whatever your summer salads and stuff are. So don't be scared to mix them into the same bed where you're doing all of your veggies. So um, zinnias are also finally showing up. I've had so many people asking for the last month, like, where are your zinnias? Where are your zinnias? They're just now showing up. Just as a quick aside, because of that super long, cold winter slash spring, everything is late. So I encourage you to just stop looking at the calendar in terms of, well, I always have them planted by Mother's Day. Well, I always have this in, you know, by the middle of May. That may be true. This year is just different because so many things were not available. They, you know, had frozen. They were greenhouse grown or protected in hoop houses. And so many of our growers are, you know, so adamant that they provide good products. So if it's not ready to go out on our shelves or to be planted in your yard, they don't release it. So we can feel confident, you know, having the kind of return policy that we have, which is that we will take things back if it doesn't do well, because we trust that our growers are giving us stuff that's going to do well. So again, know that it might be a little bit later this year than you're, you know, used to, but don't give up. And zinnias are here. 
And then also, I was just talking to Leanne, who runs the bedding department here at um, the Pleasant Hill store, and she has a nice couple of flats of milkweed. So um, the good native tropical milkweed is finally around. So definitely go out and grab that. Okay, um, so we're planting all of our summer edibles and annuals are planted. We've got some good like garden ready show offs. There's been so many beautiful dahlias that are in and Tons of different perennials are coming in now. All of the salvias and like, this is an agastache or a, um, a hummingbird mint. Just amazing. This one is pink pearl, but amazing. They smell really good. They're huge with attracting butterflies and bees and, um, and hummingbirds and all sorts of stuff. So this is a penstemon, also gorgeous. Those nice throaty plants always do really well and they are looking good right now. All of your hydrangeas are in. Most of them are in for Mother's Day. So lots of good color. We have tons of hanging baskets. So everything that we were looking for, you know, a few weeks ago is here. Grab it. Make sure that you've got some. All of our stores are stocked up on all of these goodies. But now's a good time. Um, and then also, if you have any containers, like custom pots sitting around that, you know, either you're like, okay, this is totally done. I'm just going to pull everything out and start all over again or this one didn't make it, this one didn't make it, and you just are gonna do a couple of little fill-ins in your custom pots, that's fine, now is the time. Lots of stuff available right now to do that. Um, and with, with custom plants here and for pots, it's normally the, um, doesn't have to be, but kind of our rule of thumb is the, the thrill, the fill, and the spill. So when you're thinking about your pot, like your thrill is something you know, tall like this. And then your fill is, you know, something, uh oh, sorry, Mr. Cosmos. Um, you have something a little bit shorter that's gonna kind of fill in the middle part of the, the pot. And then, you know, the rosemary's not a great spiller, so not the perfect example, but then like something like this, Calibracoa, Bacopa, um, Lis Mafia, really good spillers. So if you're updating any of your, you know, your custom pots at home, that's kind of just a good rule of thumb. Definitely doesn't have to have all of those. Don't come, you know, feeling stressed because you don't have a spiller. It's okay. Use whatever you have. But just know, like I said, it's kind of a good thing to keep in mind as you're setting it up. Things you want something that's going to give you some height, something that's going to fill in any empty space that that height is providing, and then something to kind of spill for it out of the pot. Okay, moving on. So thrill or uh, Real fill spill, and then make sure that you're using a really good potting soil. The, the slow, regular potting soil is perfect. I love organic. I really push organic for, especially for edibles. If you're doing like, you know, your tomatoes in, um, in containers, definitely use the organic. You don't have to use um, organic for your, for your flowers, but to me, anything that's edible, absolutely. And then otherwise, it's just a preference. So just a potting soil. Um, in terms of what you should be doing in terms of cleanup for May, um, it's starting to get warm except for today. So make sure you got your hat out there. You know, you can really hurt your skin with too much sun. So protect yourself, even the thing you're not thinking about. And I've gotten, I mean, I'm not really one to get sunburned that often, but the times that I have, it's when there's cloud cover and I'm not really paying attention to how hot it is. So always have your, your hat and we have some really cool ones. And I mean that because... I'm not a big hat person, but there have been some really neat ones that I've seen in the store. So if you're looking for a new sun hat, swing down. Um, always use your gloves, even just when you're not doing a big job or anything with thorns. I've gotten so many splinters just from, like, most of our soils have a little bit of mulch mixed into them just to give them that aeration. And, and if you are sorting through with your hands, I, I, and I do it all the time, um, you get these little splinters you can barely see. So always use your, split, your uh, gloves. And then we have these cool Felco uh, pruners that I love. I, this one is actually my favorite. A um, couple of different just thicknesses, and that's really what you're looking at is the, the thickness in terms of like the, the inches or whatever that, the, that it could cut in a branch. So as you're looking at what the sizing is, most of them are based on its ability to cut whatever the thickness is. And then there's also ones for lefties. So the lefties are not left out. Get it? The lefties are not left out. 
not for everybody, my jokes. Um, but lots of different kinds of uh, pruners, some of the nice, you know, smaller little snippies. I know Taylor's gonna say, Shannon, you are not close enough. I will do my best in a little bit to run up there with everything, but you guys get the gist. Okay, so tools. Um, you might have to stake some of your taller perennials, like, or even I was selling peonies the other day, at, and they're gorgeous right now. But if anybody that loves peonies, you know they get really like leggy, and just their bud stalk alone will just get like really long and tall and they tend to lay forward. I should have got one, but we have these really cool stakes and they're made out of metal and um, they're kind of a straight stake and they have like a hoop at the top and so and an opening. So you can like wrap it around your bloom, your stalk, and then you put the stake in the ground. You know, you don't have to put it all the way down there, but you need a few inches down in the ground. And then it holds those buds up. The same thing is true for gladiolas. Sometimes it's true for sunflowers. You know, so stake any of the things that are gonna be laying down on the ground in a minute if you don't take care of that. Um, and then deadhead, deadhead any of your spring bulbs. So we did a lot of, you know, selling of um, those two exactly, dahlias gladiolas, tons of different bulbs. We had caprosmia, we had all sorts of really pretty stuff. Now is about the time that like some of those, those buds are gonna be spent. So go ahead and do some deadheading, it is okay. Um, you're gonna wanna cut down next to that next leaf bracket on there and give that a nice little snip. And then in terms of the foliage, you can leave the foliage as long as it's good. As soon as it starts to look kind of raggedy, or it's turning yellow, or it's starting to get really dirty, or it's laying on the ground, you know, just pull those bottom ones. You know, most plants are like this, like new blooms and new foliage and everything blooms kind of from the middle. So as the old ones are getting lower and lower and lower down on the plant, they're kind of sagging on the ground. So easy to pull those off kind of like lettuce leaves. Okay, spring, uh, spring flowering shrub. So you're gonna wait until after they bloom. So things like azaleas, rhododendron, um, what else? Some of the roses even that have bloomed. It's okay to do a little bit of reshaping here and there and to cut down you know, any blooms that are spent that are just kind of hanging on. Give those a good pruning and just a shaping. You're not trying to do any winter pruning, right? You're just Kind of reshaping now that the, well, the first bloom has passed and now that you see what everything is looking like and like a weekend like this is way better because it's not so doggone hot and so it's not going to stress them out okay so do any kind of like sizing and shaping that you need to do for for shrubs that have already bloomed for this season and then beneficial nematodes to manage grubs ladybugs to help control like aphids and mites and other goodies um the whole idea of like beneficial insects, I, I feel like seems kind of off for a lot of people, but um, but it's it's a really easy thing to use. And it's awesome because it's not, and I mean, all of most of our, our sprays and our medicines are organic, but being able to use something that occurs naturally in nature is just, you know, such a, a, a huge bonus. And so we have um, nematodes that get down into the soil. I mean, it looks like, it just looks like dirt, um, but you are going to add them into like a bucket of water and let them like kind of fill in a little bit to like kind of puff up. And then you're just going to pour them in your soils, your soil. It's very similar to the grub beater that like a lot of people use in their lawns to get down into the ground and kill all the grubs down there in the ground before they you know, hatch and crawl up your plants and kind of reach havoc up above. The whole point of the beneficial nematodes is to get them down into the soil before all those things even take place. And so that they can attack and kill any of the grubs down in the ground before they even affect your plant. So don't be scared to try, you know, some of the beneficial nematodes. They're awesome. We use them in the nursery, um, especially in our veggie bed, which, you know, it's got so much good organic material in it that it tends to grub. You know, they are, they're like, oh, this is great soil. Thank you very much. And they plunge right in and then all of our, you know, lettuce and, and, and chard and all sorts of goodies just have all these holes in them and they're not doing well. So we use the beneficial nematodes and then everybody loves ladybugs. Um, Definitely you can, there's instructions that are on the can for release, but it's usually like in the evening, there's a wet paper towel involved. 
No, there is no way to keep the ladybugs there in your yard. This is a question I answer all the time. Well, I let them out and I feel like they just all flew away. I mean, I'm sure they didn't all fly away, but it, you know, it does happen. Make sure and put them in a place where there's already work to be done. If you're seeing aphids or anything like that on your plants, you know, get those ladybugs and, and release them right at the spot. So if they have something to eat and they're busy, they're gonna stick around, I promise. Okay. And then um, also in terms of cleanup that should be happening during May is like mulching your beds. That's a, it's a huge one and it is, I feel like it's, it's kind of tough, especially for veggie beds. I will admit right here for everybody, I'm not huge on mulching veggie beds while I'm in the midst of, you know, trying to grow all of my veggies just because I don't, I don't want to have to kind of walk through it and move it every time, but that's my own laziness. It is absolutely better for every veggie bed to have like a good soil that's got some kind of water retention in it and then also to mulch in those empty areas. It helps to conserve on water. It helps to keep weeds down. There's so many benefits. So if you're not using Forest Mulch Plus, you know, you're really missing out. And to me, it's a good mix. If you're not, if you're like me and you're not huge on having like just bark everywhere, the nice thing about Forest Mulch Plus is that it's got other, you know, additives, other components to it. It's not just bark. In fact, it is aged fur bark and chicken manure. And so it, it's like that aged bark is kind of broken down. So it feels like soil with a little bit of, you know, like a little bit of uh, wood kind of here and there. But it's perfect. It's exactly what you need for all of your veggie beds, any of your flower beds, any garden areas. Like I said, it's the, the perfect kind of in between if you're somebody like me who's not a huge bark person, but lots of different sizes of bark. And it's so good. Like I said, it's such a good protection and an easy, cheap protection for all of your soil to keep weeds away and to help you with water retention. Okay. Mulch, 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 even if I don't do what I'm telling you to do. What do they say? Do as I say, not as I do. Um, and then the things that need to get fed right now, I feel like during this time of year, we tend to be so fixated on like what's going on outside. Everything is blooming. There's veggies, like I'm going to farm to table, you know, all this stuff. And then like, your inside plants are like, oh, they're sad, they're dry, they're hot, they're fussy, they are ignored. They're in full on like drama mode, falling out. So make sure that you're still giving all of your house plants some love during this time of the year when there's so much going on outside and you so want to be out there, you know, playing with that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, indoor tap and roots is a really good one. Is it here? Hold on. Oh my God, there's so many things here. I'll show you one because I can see it. It's over there by the camera. Um, but there's also Maxi. And Maxi, the, um, the all-purpose, the acid, and the bloom. And as you're looking, as you're thinking about what it is you need to fertilize, you need to be thinking about, like, what is it that I'm trying to do? What is it not? Is it just an all-purpose and it's just regular feeding? The plant is great. Um, I just need to be feeding it on a regular basis. The all-purpose is perfect. If it's a plant that's an acid lover, like hydrangeas, camellias, rhodes, gardenias, lots of maples, daphnes, that whole um, that whole set of plants, the, the acid is really good for them. The bloom is really high in, uh, what is it? It's nitrogen, phosphorus, really high in phosphorus and potassium. So the nitrogen is for like leafing and foliage and, and um, like grass, that kind of thing. It's really heavy on the leaf side. The middle is the phosphorus. It is for bloom. It pushes any kind of like blooming, budding, fruiting, that, you know, that when you're looking at a plant, it's like, God, oh, the buds are just not fully forming or my apple tree just is not really doing well. Or, you know, it looks like they're starting and it looks like there's little flowers, but it's not making good fruit. That's where you really want to look at that number. And then the last one is the potassium. And so that's for like, roots and structure and like overall kind of plant strength it's what gives the you know the plant like it's i always think of it as like the backbone it's the element that works 
strongest for like their backbone. So don't worry about what the picture is on the front. Plants cannot read, they cannot see, they don't know that there's a hydrangea on there and you're putting it on something else or a rose and, and they're like, I'm not a rose. So that's not the case. Just use whatever one makes sense for what it is that you're doing. So pay attention to those three numbers, okay? Um, we talked about rhodes, azaleas, and camellias. The, the acid formula is really good. And we have it in a granular also. And then for veggies, be definitely using when you're planting your veggies or kind of now that they're starting to kick in into growing season because there's been more sun, you know, keep up on your fertilizing. May, done. Check, check. Moving on to June. Um, it's getting hot. It should be getting hot. I mean, we're 10 days away, 11 days away. Um, so should be heating up by June. Going to be a little bit warmer. We have to be paying attention to a few different things. Um, what is happening? So if you're following along, I'm moving on to June. Um, your veggie beds have been hard at work by June, like your tomatoes and peppers are getting taller, they're going to need to be supported if you didn't plant them with a steak or a trellis or a cage, I'm a huge tomato cage fan, um, I realize they're not the most beautiful thing in the world, and that is what it is, but they're so important and they so keep those tomatoes protected, and they allow the stalk to get nice and tall and full and it just to be covered in tomatoes without you having to worry about it falling over. So um, don't shy away from the tomato and or pepper cages, but some kind of trellis. Um, you can, you know, you can be harvesting as your veggies are maturing, especially in June. You're going to get closer to that time where you're seeing little red tomatoes and you're starting to see some, you know, kind of close to full-size peppers, especially on those smaller varieties, like some of the ties and some of the sweet peppers that are smaller. Uh, you're going to start to see those, you know, coming into uh, being ready for harvest. So don't be afraid to taste here and there, see where you are. It's kind of like a good spaghetti sauce, right? Like you got to taste it along the way to make sure you're headed in the right direction. See if there's anything that you need to be doing. Um, and also if you're pulling off things as they're, as they're maturing, then you're making more space and you're allowing more energy for the ones that are kind of coming up behind. So don't, and also, I mean, especially like in the area where I work down in Danville, probably struggle so much with like squirrels and birds and, and other little animals that love your veggie garden as much as you do. And if you leave it on there too long, I, you and I both know it'll be gone. So if it's a race to get to the tomato before the squirrels do, then by all means, my money's on you. Get out there, grab them when they're, you know, right at the right time um, so that you don't miss out. And okay, so plant, oh, so plant or reseed any herbs, you know, that you are going to want to use in the kitchen. So Jen is doing that, um, the webinar in a couple weeks on doing an herb container. But like, let's say that you planted some early and you've been using them, you've been using them and they're starting to flower and you're kind of past time on some of them. Okay, fine. Take that one out and go get another one and pop it in there. Um, there's going to be, you're going to run through some of these even before the summer is over and that's fine. So go ahead and if you use it and it's flowering and it's not as fresh as it should, would could be, then put another one in, add to it or replace it. Don't be scared to reseed any kind of herbs or other veggies that need to. Um, especially like with lettuces, you know, a lot of them come in those six packs and I try to tell people space it out so you don't end up with six ginormous heads of lettuce at once, but you know, so that's not always easy to do. So you're going to have to add more lettuce as time goes on. Um, continue to fertilize and then deadhead anything that needs to and pull that old foliage, anything that's spent or dead or just being grimy out of there. So and during this time of June, most of your perennials will be in full bloom. I mean, again, we're already like right there. Um, this barrage and I'm not pretending like I'm saying it right I could be saying it wrong like look at the flower on that guy so total double duty this is another one that's a good herb um, and you can also use the petals um, just beautiful but again starting to get in full bloom so everything even your herb garden is going to be in full bloom so get your salvias your lavenders all of that stuff like I said in full regalia by June 
So don't forget to add those pollinators in, anything that's got like nectar and pollen, especially like if you're looking at this penstemon, it has, um, you know, and if you've watched um, hummingbirds kind of to do their thing like they love these pensamen and salvias because they have this like tubular um flower and petals and like the nectar is down inside so they'll be hovering and drinking and pulling that nectar from like the base of the of the actual flower it's just amazing so you want to make sure that you have all of those in your yard so that they can then be traveling around and pollinating everything and you know letting the circle of life do what it does <clears throat> Excuse me. So hummingbirds, bees, butterflies. So salvia, agastache, penstemon, butterfly bush. If you don't have, if you have the space, although there are some really nice dwarf um, butterfly bush that you can do. Some of the pugsters are super cute and they don't get quite as you know massive as some butterfly bush do. But if you have the space and you can, you know, let a butterfly bush do its thing, man, it's just amazing. Uh, so all of those are really good for all the pollinators that are in your yard and you want to keep them coming and hanging out all summer long. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you're, so you're fruiting trees and shrubs. <clears throat> I have a cough drop. I'm telling you, this whole allergy thing is old. Taylor, do you have any questions or anything for me while I'm fumbling with my cough drop? Anything so far? Am I taking too long? No, you're doing wonderful. You're answering, you're okay. kind of answering questions as they come up anyway. So, okay, perfect. Um, but I, I can go over a couple little things. Uh, I had someone actually recently just ask uh, what to do with California poppies when they are finished blooming. Yeah. Um, and I think that kind of goes for a lot of different plants and like as they finish blooming and you're mentioning deadheading, but maybe it's just a quick explanation of really why that is and what that is. For sure. Okay, so perfect question. Thanks, Taylor. So for deadheading, I hate to use one of these because, of course, these are perfect and I picked them as such and now there's nothing really to deadhead. But let's say that this is a Cosmo. Let me over there. So these are Cosmos. And then eventually, you know, this petal is going to do its thing and then it's going to die back. So you're gonna to wanna to get rid of this. It's mostly the petals will fall off and then it'll just be this little kind of empty bud. So on this one, you can see that there's kind of like a leaf <clears throat> bracket right there below. So right in here is where I'm gonna deadhead to. So when I'm really just gonna pinch, now you can cut also, but all I did was dig my fingernail in and then just kind of clip it right from that space right there, just you know, pulled it right off so that it can regrow from here, from any place else. You can do them here, you can do a little bit down below. It just depends. You always wanna do it right at the bracket where a leaf is, is um, branching out and you wanna take it down as much as makes sense to leave space for other flowers to come in. Again, just to send that energy, I'm so sorry, Mr. Cosmo, to send that energy you know, back down into the plant so that it can be regenerating and doing its thing. There's no sense in it trying to still send energy up to this bud that's you know, already gone through its cycle. So don't be afraid to deadhead, not killing a nice, beautiful bloom the way that I did though. Yeah, and I think also it's really nice to to give people the the motivation to when you go in and, and trimming your plants is, is important and it really helps them grow nice. And also, um, a lot of times you're growing plants to look pretty and you can bring them into your house. You can make cut flower arrangements. And when you do that, you're also actually doing the act of deadheading and pruning um, and shaping your plants. So kind of put that together. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's the whole point is kind of having, and that's what's nice about gardening is that there's so many things are, you know, have dual uses. So you're right, you may have to cut this one back because it's starting to lean a little, but go get a little vase and do a nice, you know, kind of cut flower arrangement. That's a really good point, Taylor, thank you. Um, so yes, that's why we deadhead, that's how we deadhead. And it doesn't always have to be, you know, sometimes it's also just clearing space. You know, plants need good airflow. So when there's too many things like all up on each other, that's when you tend to get, you know, some fungal diseases. It's the perfect time and space for little pests and insects and stuff to get in there when it's nice and tight and like 
you know, it's like a little cave for them. So open that puppy up to the sun and the air, get good circulation. If you need to kind of trim down and I've heard somebody call it um, aesthetic pruning or, and Elizabeth Ruiz, who does like all of our pruning, like maples and roadies and all that um, classes. She talks often about creating that airflow and allowing you know plants to have space to grow and to do well it makes for better blooms it makes for stronger blooms a stronger plant overall so yeah don't be scared to to cut down if you need to yeah and if they're also if they're leaning over or spilling out or if the plants just kind of like if there's if spent flowers are laying on the ground or or the right. branch on the ground clearing out the base will will keep it protected from lots of things and bugs and lots everything. of things yeah. absolutely okay good so that's pollinators okay so fruiting trees and shrubs um you want to kind of check early for for if you're getting if you know you have an apple tree or you have an apricot tree and i mean it is just like late and there's one branch in particular that is super laden with fruit so much so that it's like leaning down that it's too heavy and you can see that it's putting pressure on that branch if you need to remove some of the fruit a little bit early just to give that one branch a break so that it doesn't break, um, don't be afraid to do that, okay? At the end of the day, a healthy tree is going to produce good fruit. So if you're losing branches because there's so much fruit on this one branch, it's you know not helping in the way that you need it to be helping for the overall health of the tree. And thus, your like, overall harvest, sometimes you have to, you know, Sometimes you gotta just one for the team and you're gonna have to get rid of some of that fruit and don't be scared to do that. I know we're not there yet, but kind of keep an eye on things. If you see something that's like really leaning under pressure, you may need to relieve that by getting rid of some of that fruit. I mean, and I don't, I like tart apples, but I know not everybody does, but um, maybe there's some use for it. The composter, that would be another really good place to put any fruit that hasn't quite come to, you know, full bloom yet, but is causing problems for branch, definitely compost it. I'm sure you guys are way more crafty and somebody's probably like, oh, well, you can can, I'm just, there's probably a million reasons and other like things that you can do that none are coming to my head right now, of course. Um, okay, and then citrus and blueberries that um, to maintain like that soil acidity, you're gonna have to, as the season is going on and as they're starting to fruit and, and you have your like picking blueberries left and right, make sure you're adding a little bit more acid back into that soil, especially for citrus and blueberries. So the FST, I recommend this all the time for citrus trees. It's a really good one. You can also use it on your blueberries. It's, um, it's iron and sulfur. It helps to add a lot of that nitrogen back in, really helps with the leaves. Um, anytime you're seeing like that yellowing, which we tend to get over the winter, especially on this side of the bay, the FST really helps. I thought there was another acid. I, it, it's in the, um, it should be in the notes. Also Liquinox, did I put it in here? Yes, I did. What do you know? Liquid, Liquinox, the iron and zinc is another really good one. And it's one that's liquid that you can dilute into water. So that's another really easy way to kind of get that acid base back in there. Okay, moving on. It's a jungle out there. Lots of summer insects and pests. Like we already kind of talk, talked about, um, but at this by June, it's like full effect. They're everywhere. They're eating everything. They're biting your skin. They're doing all sorts of horrible things. So any kind of like slugs, your pear and rose slugs, weevils, aphids, thrips, um, you can use Captain Jack's like dead bug for that. Let me see, there it is. And so this one is, um, says that it's for like chewing, that it's for chewing bugs. So anything it has on here, spider mites, caterpillars, toddling moth, bagworms, leaf miners, uh, borers, anything that kind of bores through things, beetles, that kind of, Thing. I've had so many people come in and they'll bring a leaf or a picture of a leaf and they're like, what's eating this? I mean, my rule of thumb, and I could be wrong, so I'm sure that the, the slow world will correct me. When I look at a leaf like that, when the, when the eating is along the outside, it tends to be one of those chewers. It's caterpillars, it's some kind of slug, it's those munchers. When you see the holes like randomly in the middle, 
that tends to be more um, earwigs or pincher bugs. And there's definitely, you know, sprays and all sorts of goodies that can be used for all of those. But just as you're looking at any damage to your leaves, I feel like it's kind of an easy rule of thumb that the pincher bugs tend to make random holes in the middle and those chewers tend to get like the outsides of leaves. Now, I mean, a pincher bug is not going to like mow it down to a stalk and neither is a caterpillar unless you leave it there forever. Some, you know, you might have a bunny, you might have all sorts of other things, but when you're seeing just those leaves eaten away, those are the two things. So the Captain Jack's is a really good spray and it is organic and it is safe to use on your veggies and any kind of edibles. Uh, the other one that I mentioned here is the, um, the Monterey BT. Oh, there's also, and this is handy. I recommend these all the time. This is a concentrate. It's also the Captain Jack's dead bug. But you put your hose in here. So you put your hose in this end and then you adjust the flow out here. And then you can kind of hold it. I don't know if you can see that. You kind of hold it like a fireman's um, hose, you know, so, so that you can get things that are taller or bigger than just you kind of standing there giving yourself a carpal tunnel, you know, trying to spray to dripping, which is most of, uh, what most of them say for application. So, you know, don't be afraid to use one of the concentrates. It doesn't mean that you have to have 50,000 trees. It just means that it might be a little bit easier for you to get a larger tree or multiple trees or even just bigger bushes you know with any of those don't be afraid to use the concentrate it's a little bit more expensive but it goes a much longer way and for most of these you have to do more than one application anyway okay so the monterey bt is right here this one is mostly for like bud worm although it has a list of things also um, helps control worms and caterpillars on fruits, vegetables, ornamentals, and shade trees and around the home garden. That's us. Okay, so those are two of the really good um, medicines that will help kind of keep those bugs away and help protect your plants. Also like the sluggo, I don't know if I put that in here. I'm sure it's someplace. Um, the sluggo is also another really good one. There's the sluggo and then there's like the bug and slug killer. And those are both also really, really good, but use the sluggo plus because it's the only one, the bug and slug killer, and then the sluggo plus are the ones that have the, um, that can help protect against pincher bugs. If it doesn't have a little picture of them, it doesn't work as well. Okay. Uh, okay. Here I am for uh, snails, slugs, and earwigs. Okay, moving on. A quick question, uh, quick question yes. related to that too. Um, what's some, do you have any good quick tips on how to actually find the bugs in the garden or when you should maybe look for them or something like that? I think that's kind of helpful for people when they're, they're like, oh, I don't have any bugs in the garden, but sometimes it's just how you look for them or when. For sure. I mean, so bugs like to, you know, I, I feel like in, like in most cases, they don't really want to be seen. So they tend to tuck. They're on the back side of leaves. They're, they're tucked down inside of like where the leaf meets the stalk, where that little branch is. They tend to be in there, um, again, on the back side of leaves. For chewing, you're gonna see, you're gonna see it, you know, while you're out there. You need to, I mean, if you're gonna have a veggie garden and you're gonna be harvesting like it, you need to be paying attention to like how the plants are doing. If you're not out there every day, then you're out there every couple of days, really making sure that things are looking good. And you're gonna have to check here and there. So if you don't see like the the eating the signs, the telltale signs of pincher bugs or caterpillars, that kind of thing. If any of your plants start to not do well, you really need to start paying attention to those places. Again, backside of leaves. Um, tucked down into like the, the kind of little leaf bracket that's away from the stalk. Um, I think that first thing in the morning is probably the best time to look. Um, I've heard other people say that like, you know, before the end of the day is also a really good time toward the evening. Um, what else did I miss, Taylor? Yeah, so I, I think that's definitely it. And I, one thing I recommend sometimes when people are unsure about uh, caterpillars or something like that, evening or early morning like sometime when it's not the sun's out that's when they're actually yeah they hide. for sure <laughs> absolutely you can see it a little bit better and it doesn't hide their tracks 
you know, yeah. when you get the sun glare, you don't really see the tracks as well. I mean, snails tend to give themselves away as do slugs, but yeah, in the full sun, it's hard to see those. So morning and then later on in the evening, and like I said, you're going to have to kind of get your stethoscope and put your glasses on and, you know, get in there and kind of be, be a plant doctor every once in a while, especially if you see that it's not doing as well as you think it should be doing. Um, but even just in general, giving them a good look over, um, even giving them a rinse down. I know a lot of people say, oh, don't water from the top if you can avoid it. Sometimes I think just giving them a good rinse down sometimes just knocks off some of those bugs. I was talking to a family the other day about spit bugs, um, which I don't see as much anymore. I think it's interesting. When I was young, I feel like there were spit bugs everywhere. And when we were looking up just kind of what the remedy was, one of the top things was just to rinse it off really good with a hose. And so, you know, sometimes that's a good start. And then if you need to up at a level if you need to you know bring your next higher game then you can get into some of these sprays and doing what needs to be done to just kind of protect but you can start with some of the more home remedy type styles i like to anyway yeah not that know. you shouldn't get products <laughs> uh and i know you have a bit more to go through just give me a little time update we're about 40 minutes in too okay perfect i will talk fast i'm, I'm more than halfway done Okay, so moving on, if you're following on the, on the outline, um, I'm hungry, are you hungry? Um, all of these plants by this time in June, like they are working. They are, are like little freight trains, just growing and producing and moving energy around and doing what they're supposed to be doing and they get hungry. And so, you know, it's like you going out and around a golf or, you know, a nice run, a great hike, you know, up Mount Diablo, you're hungry, I'm tired, I'm hungry. So make sure that you're still feeding things even throughout the season. It's not just something that you plop in when you plant, you know, whatever the, uh, whatever the plant is, you're going to want to make sure that you're fertilizing throughout the season. So make sure that you're feeding. So for roses, um, that time of the year, something like a sulpo mat, which I don't know if I have here. It's funny, I have different stuff at my store than everybody has also. So I don't have a, uh, um, a something to show you of the sulpo mat, but it's, it is, um, it's a box, it's a granular um, fertilizer that works really well on roses and on lots of other things, and it really helps to promote bloom. So that's a good one. I will do better about making sure you guys have an example. Um, for like your perennials and annuals, any kind of multi-purpose, granular or liquid, edibles, you know, tomato, veggie food. So I want to talk really quick about the difference between granular and what either liquid or dilutable fertilizers. I equate it to one thing. Um, I used to be like allergic to everything and I'm telling you, every time I turn around, I had to get a run of penicillin when I was young. And so I equate the difference between granular and liquid fertilizer to taking the run of pills of penicillin or getting the shot. So the run of pills takes a little bit longer to take effect, but stays in your system for longer. I don't know that it's better or worse, but definitely works like a little bit slower and fully. Whereas the liquid is immediate, like you, the swelling immediately goes down. My poor little red face was, you know, back to color more quickly, but it also left my system faster. So I would always end up doing a little bit of both, like give me the shot and give me a shorter run of pills. So that is the difference in fertilizers um, as I see them. The liquid is broken down already. You don't have to wait for it to kind of water in and break down it's like the granular is um the whole point of it is that it breaks down slower so that 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 food those vitamins kind of stay in your soil for longer um which is awesome but again if you've got something that is like hanging on by its last leg maybe you do the liquid to get it in there get some medicine pumping in there you know get the iv going you might need to do some cpr hopefully not but that's kind of the difference between the fertilizers as I use them and as I recommend them. Again, you might have another 
slope person or some other gardener tell, oh my God, that's nonsense. And, and, it, and I, I guess it, it could be, but the, the liquid version, I use it a little bit more often. I don't use quite as much. Um, and I like it because I feel like it's instant results. Whereas any of the granulars take a little bit longer to break down, but stay for longer. Okay, that's my 101 on which fertilizer is better. Um, lastly, it ain't over till it's over. Oh, so water restriction. So we had a great winter, we all know, in terms of rain, but, and there have been definitely some of the water restrictions have been lifted, hopefully, depending on how the summer is. And so many people are like, well, what do you think? I have no idea. We have no idea what the summer's gonna be like. Um, you know, fingers crossed that it's a nice, perfect summer with lots of sun, not too crazy in the hundreds for too many days, but we're not really sure. And you still need to be careful on your water. So definitely you want to be using things that are going to help you to maintain that, you know, that water, that liquid, that moisture in your soil. So we already talked about mulching and about using something like forest mulch. Plus the other thing that you can use is um, soil moist. A lot of people don't know about soil moist. It is, um, it kind of looks like, it looks like rock salts is actually what it looks like, but it's similar to perlite in that as it gets wet, it like puffs up and holds water. And so it's a really good um, product. They're like little granules. It's a really good product. Sorry, this is soil moist. All of our stores have it. Um, to add into your soil, like right into the holes where you're planting things so that you can, you know, so that there's more, more um, there's more components in there that can kind of hold on to water so that you're having to water less often. Um, that is at the end of the day, like best case scenario is that you've got good soil, that soil has some, you know, moisture retention capabilities, whether it's mulch, whether it's perlite, you know, something like soil moist. Lots of people use lots of different things, pumice, all, all sorts of stuff. So soil moist is a real good one. If you haven't heard of it or haven't touched it to see what it feels like, um, definitely do. As soon as you get it wet, it's like, it reminds me of like tapioca, almost. It kind of, you know, gets puffed up. It almost feels like gel or like a nice body scrub. So don't scrub it on your body, though, okay? All right, that's it for June. Phew! We're floating, Taylor. Now we're in July. Uh, come on in, the water's fine. Hopefully by July that is the case. I get that I'm kind of making a stretch here on um, what the weather is going to be like and assuming that all is well. But we're in July. Imagine it with me. There are beautiful flowers everywhere. Everything is blooming. It's amazing. It's hot. We're all at the pool. We're barbecuing. There's you know, butterflies and bees flying around. Everything is being pollinated. Dogs and cats living together. It's beautiful. It's July. Let's go. Um, all of your easy annuals, again, you are updating them as they're getting spent. You're deadheading still. You're adding new ones. You know, as we're moving through the season, there's always lots more stuff that pops up. We're just starting to see vinca kind of creep in. People, oh my God, I've been asking about impatience like crazy. We're starting to see impatience. Lots of our stores have them. We have some at the Diablo uh, store. So impatience are out. Vinca will be out, you know, really soon. So lots more things are there in terms of your perennials. You know, Bidens are in full bloom and your, your Lysianthus is in full bloom, geraniums, um, everything is beautiful and loving that heat and sucking it up. And, but again, still cut or, or pinch off any spent flowers. Make sure that you're keeping those things updated as you're going through. And that my next point on here is how to water. So we've talked ad nauseum here at Sloan about whether to do like a quick tutorial on how to water. It seems ridiculous, right? I mean, you take the water, you put it on the plant, you get the soil wet, like you're done, class dismissed. But you'd be surprised how often there's confusion about how to water things, especially as it pertains to drip irrigation. We're huge fans of drip irrigation. We understand and support all sorts of water conservation modes, but drip irrigation can be really hard on plants in terms of 
their need to be fully soaked less often. So when you're watering, let's say you're watering your, you have a nice, beautiful 12 inch custom pot that you put together. It's got a nice fountain grass and it's got a beautiful salvia. And then you've got a Lismachia as your spiller. Did you get it? Throw, fill, spill. So, and you are ready to water it. Turn your hose on a little bit lower and water that puppy until every ounce of soil is wet. Every ounce of soil is wet. So you see it coming out the bottom, like running out the bottom, not the first time, because as we all know, water will find the fastest point from A to B. So if you're watering it, it slides down that dry spot where the soil has pulled away from your pot and out the bottom, that doesn't count as like water coming out the bottom and it's fully watered. You don't want to have it the spray on too high because it'll splash out it'll overflow that's why we always say you know keep an inch or two at the top of your pot so that the water can kind of accumulate and soak in you really want every every ounce of soil to be wet when you're watering then let it dry out now there are definitely some plants that this doesn't count for if you have like bog plants or pond plants or things like that that like like a little bit more water, then maybe I'm not talking about those. But as we're talking about like all of these perennials and your veggies, good deep soak less often. So, and again, it's tough with drip because the whole point of drip is that it's like a short amount of time often. So it's exactly the opposite. So where you can, if you can, if you want to, um, you know, change some of that timing on your zones. Instead of doing it every day for five minutes, do it, you know, for 20 minutes, you know, every third day, something like that. So that you're getting, you want that water to like get down into the soil. You don't want it to stay up here because then that teaches all the roots that they have to stay up there also. And that's how you get these like super weak, you know, plants that don't, that aren't strong rooted because their roots are staying up high and you want them to go deep. So get a deep root irrigator if you need to. That's why I've talked about those so many times. You want that water down low. So even if you just supplement every once in a while, you've got your regular, you know, drip irrigation, drag your hose out there, put it on low, let it soak the area, you know, 10 minutes. And maybe you do that as an addition once a week. You know your soil and your setup better than I do. So just know that those long, deep soaks are way better than, you know, this constant watering all day, all the time. Okay, that's my, and I'm sure everybody's going to email me and fuss, and that's fine. We can talk about it. I'm comfortable not being perfectly right all the time. So, um, but again, good, deep watering is better than just a little smattering that doesn't fully soak a pot or a plant or an area, which is another reason why we talk all this, you know, about getting things in there that hold moisture so that if you don't have the ability to really soak an area, then all the, you know, soil moist and the mulch and the perlite and all the other goodies, they're soaking up some of that water so that as you know, if things get dried out, they, they're still there to keep things moist and to kind of release some of that water back into the soil. Okay, I'm getting off of my soapbox now about watering. Um, in terms of water though, you really want, especially during the summer, um, you want to kind of be looking out for our thirsty, you know, bird friend. So bird baths are awesome. Not only are they beautiful and, you know, bring all the kind of birds to your area, but they also really, you know, allow them to have something to drink while they're flying, you know, down the pollinating highway. And while they're kind of going from house to house, it allows them a spot to kind of, you know, regroup. It gives them a place to set. And we've talked before about if you have a bird bath, um, put a few rocks or something nice in there that will allow like bees and other things like that to kind of to be able to like step out into the bowl and drink also and not you know immediately get drowned by not having a place to put their feet they can't swim as we all know so put a few little rocks or something like that some little bobbles of some kind that allow bees a place to kind of stop over in your bird bath so that they can get a drink of water that is my uh, my tip for the day and so resting rocks. Okay, not all insects are beneficial. So we were talking about like the, the nematodes and the ladybugs and 
you know, praying mantis and the lace wings and all these goodies that are out there that are beneficial insects. Um, yellow jacket traps, if you haven't seen one, um, you know, by full summer. And again, remember we're in July now, pretend we're in July. So those, those yellow jacket traps need to be, you want to put them like at the perimeter of your yard, not like right around your gazebo or your pergola or right outside your door. You want them to kind of be on the outside so that they keep yellow jackets from coming into the yard. Um, so that's one recommendation. For white flies, um, lots of people are struggling with white flies right now. So definitely be using your sticky traps. This is, um, this is um, an example of one of our sticky traps. These things work great. And you can, you like fold them into a little origami thing and then you can hang them in, you know, within your bushes and within your trees and they work really well. They really help to take care of white fly. There's a couple of different sprays that are white fly. Did I put one down here? Hold on. No, I didn't. There's one spray that is for white flies. Was it the BT? might have been the BT. I'll have to do some more research. I can't remember off the top of my head. I was just looking at one the other day. I think it was the insecticidal soap. Anyway, um, there are sprays for white fly, but the traps work really well, and especially when you're using it on something that's an edible. The, the, trap, the trap is nice just so you don't have to worry about any extra spraying. Um, the other thing that I read about, and I don't know that this is true. I was going to do some more research before today but time got away from me but i heard that like using earthworm castings as a deterrent for white flies is helpful like just spreading a bag of earthworm castings around like a bush where you're struggling with white flies or around an area that it can help act as a deterrent i need to confirm this and i am trusting you guys to get on there and do some google research and you're going to email me i'm going to give you my email address before we're gone and i, I want to know what you found um mites you know there's lots of sprays for them you can also cut them back fuchsia specifically gets like a fuchsia mite you're going to have to cut that one back a bit down to like six or so inches from the infected site thrips like scale there's all kinds of things that attack during the summer because we're in july um you know you find them on shade plants and then you can use like the horticultural oil is a really good one um there's also the organicide so this is the horticultural oil i'm sure a lot of you use it as a dormant spray which is awesome then this one is the be safe organicide this is another really good one to use um again it obviously is super protective of our friendly bees so it doesn't bother them and then i kind of saved the best for last or the worst for last as the case may be, gophers, gophers, and moles and voles. Um, I feel like something about digging a hole in the dirt is like the jungle call for gophers. Like if you didn't have gophers before and you, you know, rototill and pull apart an area and go to plant it, you are going to have gophers. I don't know what it's all about, but I'm, I'm telling you it's true. The second that they feel the earth, you know, being disrupted, they like come in force and they are so wretched and so hard to get rid of. And they can just be devastating to a new garden. And they have no regard for how much money you spend, how much time and toiling. So use gopher baskets and, um, and cages. I know it's a bit of a hassle. Um, I like the baskets as opposed to the cages. And again, this is just preference. There's nothing wrong with the cage. The cage is a little more rigid and it's stronger. So there's that plus side, but it's, you have to dig a bigger hole because they're, you know, they're, they're squared and they're really rigid and you have to kind of push them in to shape them to, you know, the, the kind of round columnarness of the bottom of your plant. So the cages are a little more rigid. They definitely seem stronger and like a tougher gauge, um, but you, you do have to dig a bigger hole and really kind of elbow grease it in to get them to work correctly. The baskets are like little socks, not little socks, but they're like socks. They're super bendable. I didn't grab one, I apologize. 
um, sometimes I double up on it. If I'm like, you know what, this is like, I have a feeling that there's a lot of gophers right now. I'm going to double up on the basket and they're all sold by size. So if you get a one gallon plant, get a one gallon cage or basket. Um, again, you can double up two gallon, two gallon, you know, basket or cage. So lots of different sizes, definitely protect your plants before you put them in the ground. If there's any reason in the world you think that you either do or might have gophers. And let me tell you, if your neighbor has gophers or you back up to open space, you have gophers. They may not have made it to where you are yet. Maybe you've got a nice, you know, seven foot ravine of cement somehow. Congratulations. But otherwise, if your neighbor has them, you have them. If you're in open space, they're coming. So just make sure you protect yourself and protect your plants. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, again, everybody's hungry. It's hot, everybody's hungry. Make sure that you're feeding. Water-soluble fertilizers are a double duty this time of the year because you have to dilute them into water anyway. So you're adding a little bit more water along with that food. So like, that's perfect. Use your, your liquid fertilizers during the summer if that's something that you like to use anyway because it is killing two birds with one stone. The maxi that we talked about is really good. This is also the fish on. Um, is another really good fertilizer. You know, so many of our fertilizers are made out of, you know, like things from the ocean, lots of kelp and algaes and um, like kind of fish excrement for lack of a better term, but tons of good vitamins in there. And so, you know, I, I know the smell is not the best. I don't, there's, there's no real explanation for that. I can't change that, but, you know, dilute it. Do it in the evening, and then usually by the next day, that smell is really dissipated. You know, a day or so later, you don't smell it at all. But don't be scared to use those kind of ocean-based, sea-based um, fertilizers. They're awesome, just awesome. Um, try to feed when it's cooler, so early morning or later in the evening. You don't want to go out there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in July and be trying to feed things that can be too much. Um, if you're doing some, if you, when you're doing a fertilizer, wet the ground a little bit first so that the, the ground is more accepting of, you know, water or anything you're putting in there and then water it again so that it doesn't fly away with the wind or, you know, whatever else just from you stepping on it. Uh, let's see what else. And it's okay to fertilize even if you have mulch down. So many people are like, well, what am I supposed to do? There's like mulch everywhere. It's okay. I mean, that's the whole point of this is that if you're using a liquid fertilizer, it's going to run right through there down into the soil. And if you're using a granular, you can rake that mulch away a little bit, or, you know, you just kind of sprinkle it within there and then water it in really good. You may have to do a little bit of extra watering, you know, if you've got mulch down the second time, just to make sure that it's not all just sitting on top of the mulch. You want to get it down to where it's supposed to go. Um, but you fertilize even if you have mulch. Um, and then a quick ode to our desert friends. Um, I have so many people that come in. I want some succulents and some cactus because they don't need any water. And it's just, it's just a misconception that succulents and cacti don't need any water. They absolutely need water. Maybe not as much as, you know, all the other plants that are in the yard that are, because they're so much more acclimated to dry, hot conditions, but it can get too hot for them and they can get super thirsty. So, so water, you know, water them the same way that you would water anything else. Plus they have like little tiny baby root structures. Um, I'm like literally talking Taylor's language here, so I'll let him co-sign, but you know, definitely water your, water your cactus and your succulents, whether they're in pots, whether they're in the yard, um, definitely keep them taken care of, even though it's the summer and technically it's, you know, their time of year. I think that's it. I think you got through it. <laughs> I am like a speed talker, Taylor. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so much very good information. Thank you for going through all of that. Um, I think it's really helpful having everything around you too. I mean, if, if you see anything on the screen right now that you're interested in or you want to yeah. know more about or want to know like how to get it, 
come into our stores, ask our staffs, talk to our staff, see what they use. We're all yeah. pretty much gardeners here. So we're all using different products and we have different ideas, um, but generally we'll follow similar and uh, same yeah. guidelines um, on them. So <laughs> I want to get yep. my email address. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So I'm at, I'm at Sloat7. So it's S-L-O-A-T, Sloat, the word seven, S-E-V-E-N, and then the number seven at gmail.com. So Sloat77 at gmail.com. If anything I said was too rushed or you have any questions or you want me to clarify something that I was trying to rush through, you can always email me. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you guys have. Okay, that's it. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, and all of our Sloats have a, a similar kind of uh, email for each of the different Sloats. So if you want to get in contact with them about what they have in stock or ask some questions, it's a good way of doing it. Um, but it's also sometimes it's honestly a little bit better to actually come into a store and talk to us in person so you have that totally. conversation. Uh, but I am excited to get out there, work on our gardens. I hope everyone has a little bit of motivation to get some cool plants, get some cool products, go trim their plants, go prune things, um, mulch everything. I think also thank yes. you for talking about watering succulents. It's also <laughs> for sure a misconception that they yes. don't need anything. Um, so uh, all lots of good, good information. and. Um, I'm sorry to say that we won't be having any more of these what to do's for a couple months or so, but we will be back in the fall, ready yes. to go, more information. Um, so definitely look out for that. And I hope everyone enjoys their summer. Come to our last yeah. class we're going to have on June 3rd. It's about yes. creating an herb planter um, with Jen. And yeah, I hope you have a good rest of your Saturday, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you, Bye, you guys. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good day.